Good morning and Happy New Year. Welcome to Live Spring. Uh, we would invite you to stand and worship, worship with us. Your presence in this place, 
your glory on our face we're looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now lord unveil our eyes you're the reason we're singing you're the reason we're singing open up the Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Spring Community Church. So glad that you could be here with us on this first Sunday of 2021. Uh, what a great way to start the year. Um, I want to uh, remind you if you are uh, wanting to participate with us in communion, uh, we have uh, some self contained elements there in, in the back that you can uh, grab and we'll give you further instructions in the service. And if you're at home, you can get a little piece of flatbread and cracker, uh, a little cup of, uh, of wine or juice, and, uh, and, we'll, um, and participate with us uh, in, in that way as well. I'd also like to uh, let you know that, that we would like to connect with you. And, and uh, if you want to connect with us, we've made that possible on the website. Just hit the connect button, and uh, you can uh, let us know if you want prayer, or if you want to join a group, or uh, connect with us in some other way. There's also a way to give on the website, and uh, giving is a part of our worship. When we give of what the Lord has already given to us, uh, it's, it's a form of worshiping, just like forgiving is a form of worship as well. Um, now, uh, with, with the, uh, the giving thought in mind here, I wanted to share with you an update on the place to gather. Uh, as, as you may know, LifeSpring is building a place to gather to bless the, the neighborhoods and schools and families of the greater Richmond Spring Grove area. And uh, we have been working on this project for a couple years. It's not just building a church building, but it's actually uh, the, it, it's uh, 20 acres that will be uh, used for the community as well as the church. So we're excited about this, but we had gotten towards the, the end of our campaign and realized we needed about $500,000 to finish uh, the project. And uh, th while that may have seemed daunting, it's, it's about 10% of, of what the whole entire project was left. And so at the end of October, we announced that and uh, we asked uh, for people to uh, pray about giving, and, uh, and by the, uh, the 31st was our deadline. So I wanted to announce that number here. Uh, so we needed $500,000, and we received $504,000, uh, 50422, uh, however you say that. Uh, so <laughs> praise God. Uh, So, uh, so we, are, we are very thankful. Thank you for all who have given. And, and I, I've got to tell you, giving uh, really warms my heart, not because of what's given, but because of what it, uh, what it does for someone's heart when they give. When we give of ourselves, we actually take action uh, towards the Lord. So, uh, so thank you. 
Now, um, one other thing, um, as I mentioned, this is the first Sunday of 2021, and, uh, and last Sunday, of course, was the last Sunday of 2020. Now, many have looked to 2021 with great anticipation because 2020 was, let's just face it, it was a, it was a pretty rough year. And, uh, and, and I want to say that I, I, I also am looking to 2021 with, uh, with anticipation, expectation. I'm hoping for healing for our country. I'm hoping for no mask. Maybe we can have a mask burning party. I'm hoping for uh, all, all sorts <laughs> of things I'm hoping for this year. But I want to, I would just want to remind us all that uh, whether it's 2020 or 2021, uh, the year, the circumstances are not our hope. Who's our hope? And you can, you can answer me here. One, two, three. Who's our hope? Yeah. Jesus. All right. King Jesus is our hope. So uh, thank you for that. Well, I'm going to uh, do our first scripture reading. This is from 1 Peter 1, 15 through 25. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Well, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Let's rise together and continue in song. Sure, the price it has been paid for 
for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.
Good morning. Uh, welcome to Life's Morning. I'm going to read our second scripture reading from Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Thank you, Scott. For all of us who struggle with identity issues, we've got to remember we have a good father, and it's who we are. We're loved by him. Well, um, many of you know Bev Santler, Beverly Santler, an old saint who has been part of this congregation for many years, um, died last Sunday from cancer. And knowing that she would die soon, Beverly wanted to have a memorial service when everyone could gather freely um, and be able to celebrate her life. Well, this is not that time due to the pandemic, and so we're going to wait to have a memorial service until this summer. But I've invited uh, Lucy, Bev's daughter, to come share a few words with us. Um, we want to remember our friend who just passed away. And, uh, and also, um, I think it's appropriate for us to think of Beverly, who died on, on the last Sunday of uh, 2020. And uh, today, as we celebrate the first Sunday of 2021, is Dancing in the Streets of Heaven. So, Lucy, please come share with us. Good morning. As Pastor Cabot said, my name is Lucy, and I'm Bev Santler's youngest daughter. I would like to start by thanking Pastor Cabot for inviting my family and I here today to share a bit about Mon's life. I know so many of you have been praying for her, and I want to thank you all as well. The heartfelt words of encouragement in cards, texts, and voicemails were all appreciated. You are a congregation of kind and caring people. And mom was blessed to know each and every one of you. Mom was born in Manchester, Iowa on March 18, 1932. She spent her early years growing up in Manchester, and at the age of nine, my grandparents moved to Chicago. Mom always loved Chicago. She used to say it was her favorite city, and she wished she could live and die in a high-rise condo on Lake Michigan. Mom was, my mom met my dad and married him in 1950. They had three daughters. My oldest sister, Susie, died in 1996 at the age of 45, and my dad died seven months later. My sister, Karen, died in 2015. She was 59. Mom had to endure the hardest thing a parent would have to go through, and that is the loss of a child. And she did. She had to endure it twice. When mom was first diagnosed with pancreatic cancer on September 30th, she was immediately filled with fear. The memory of the pain and the suffering that her sister, my Aunt Peggy, had experienced 15 years prior from the same disease consumed her every thought. Mom knew her prognosis was grim, but she quickly went to work comforting her friends as she shared her diagnosis and her inevitable death. I remember so vividly her sitting at the kitchen table with her telephone book, calling her friends and telling them not to cry because we all have to die sometime. She also reached out to Pastor Cabot and recorded a phone conversation to be played the next Sunday at church. Some of you may have heard her say that she was not afraid to die, but she was really disappointed that she wasn't going to live to be 100. I think she also said she was the oldest member, right? Was that ever confirmed? Or? <laughs> she went on to say, you can't be sad when you're going to meet your maker. Throughout all the loss and heartache, she remained strong in her faith, and she told me she looked forward to seeing my dad, my sisters, and so many other loved ones again in heaven. Mom had many dear friends who could count on her for a surprise visit or a lengthy phone call to catch up. She traveled around the country to visit them when she could, receiving many visitors in return. When they couldn't talk or visit, she took pleasure in writing letters. Mom was also a talented seamstress and actually sewed for the Nutcracker Ballet in Chicago. She loved reading, crossword puzzles, bird watching, and Hallmark movies. I think our DVR is still filled with every Hallmark Christmas movie that's ever been released. But above all, Mom was most proud of her family. She had nine grandchildren 
12 great-grandchildren and three great-great-grandchildren. She led by example and was truly a role model for our family. She will be greatly missed by all who knew her, but I'm confident that she had a great reunion when she arrived in heaven. Thank you again for all of your thoughts and prayers. Your kindness really meant so much to mom and to our entire family, so thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Lucy and her family drove an hour to be here at church. Who drives an hour to church? Thank you for, uh, for making the trip over here. We're, we're grateful, and, and we're very grateful that uh, you've shared Beverly with us. Um, well, let's, uh, let's take a minute and... Uh, oh, before, before that, I, I want to I say this um, about Beverly. Um, Beverly was a woman who um, spoke what was on her mind, and, uh, and I, you may know that about her. Uh, but some people, you know, when, they, when they're just telling it like it is, um, what they think is the spiritual gift of discernment is actually the, uh, uh, the blight of criticism. And that, that wasn't Beverly. Uh, she told it like it was, but with integrity of heart. That's an important distinction. Beverly spoke the integrity of heart, and when Beverly decided to become part of LifeSpring, she contacted the church she was at before and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in this area. I want to uh, be a part of this church. And she had closure with the old church before she came here to the new church. Not many people do that. Most people just leave the old church, kind of leave everybody hanging, and nobody ever knows what happened to them. Uh, but Beverly had integrity of heart. She cared about relationships. And for some reason, God thought it humorous to give me a soft voice. Uh, I, who speak uh, publicly often, uh, have been given a small mouth and a soft voice. I'll have to talk to God about that in the future sometime and find out why that's the case. Maybe it's a divine sense of humor or something like that. But Beverly would always tell me, speak up, I can't hear you. <laughs> if I'm not amplified, I'm hard to hear. Uh, but, uh, but Beverly would remind me that I should speak with integrity of heart boldly so that all can hear just a, a couple more thoughts about Beverly. Now let's go ahead and pray and, uh, and give thanks to God. Um, Father God, help us to trust you and hope in you as Beverly Santler trusted you and hoped in you. All that we are and all that we have is yours. There is nothing we possess, no talents, no relationships, no physical possessions that did not come from your hand. You gave us the days and seasons. Your mercies are new every morning. At the sunset of our lives, we who have trusted in Jesus await the most glorious heavenly morning. Thank you for the years that we have here on earth and the eternity and the new heaven and earth yet to come. Because every good gift is from you, it is only fitting that we bring some of these gifts back as an offering. And with this in mind, we set the year of 2021 before you as an offering. We give these 365 days for your glory. Would you take this offering from our hands and be glorified in our lives? And would you let the name of Jesus be praised on our lips, helping us to boldly live by your Holy Spirit as Christ's followers for the glory of your name? Father, help us to be a blessing to the church and the community that we live in so that all might see the light of Christ in us. And God, we pray for our nation, that we would not be a nation divided, but rather one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Father, we also pray for the world you love so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for. Let men and women and children from every nation and tribe worship you. Let us stand as a beautiful and holy mosaic testifying to the glory of your grace. Now, Father, may the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. When I was a boy living in the foothills of California, the soil in that area was too poor to grow crops. If you were to stick a shovel in the ground, it would take quite a while to dig a hole because the soil was half rock. Rather than growing crops as people did in the Central Valley, uh, people in our area had uh, cows and horses and, and uh, other animals, ranches. 
As a boy, I learned about livestock and how to construct fences, how to buck hay, cut and split wood. Uh, I came to know some of the ranchers in that area, modern-day cowboys, you might think of them. In fact, when we first moved to that area, they were running cattle down the street, and it's, it was official, officially an excuse to be late to school because ranchers were running cattle down the streets. Um, so as I got to know some of the ranchers, there was one man in particular, we'll call him Bill, that taught me about livestock. Uh, he also taught me where not to keep my treasure. Now, Bill knew a lot about animals, cattle, pigs, and horses, but Bill didn't trust institutions, including banks. Instead of keeping his money in the bank, Bill would put his cash in a jar and bury it in the ground. One day, Bill needed money from his stash, and unburying his jar, he found that termites had eaten his treasure. This is a true story. Uh, all that remained was a jar full of termite droppings. Has anyone ever done something like that and willing to admit it? <laughs> any, any backyard barriers here? Are you going to go check as soon as you get home? Just, just curious. Um, now, you're, I know you're probably thinking that uh, Bill should not have buried his treasure in the ground. Burying his treasure in the ground didn't seem like a very good idea, but actually the problem is twofold. First, Bill should not have buried his treasure in the ground, and secondly, if Bill was going to bury his treasure in the ground, he should have picked a different kind of treasure to bury. Why am I telling you this story? Well, as we come to a close of 2020 and the beginning of a new year, 2021, I think it's important that we examine the treasure that we have placed and where we have placed it. Even though most of us use banks and cards and ATM machines, the type of treasure that we are collecting, the conditions that we have placed it in just might result in termite droppings in a jar. The Word of God helps us to understand what we should treasure. In, this, in September, we began a series called Christ is Better. It's, ba uh, it's based on the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews, by the way, is probably the best, I won't say probably, I'll take the word probably out of there, it is the best book in Scripture helping us to understand how the New Testament and the Old Testament fit together and understanding the rich promises of God in Christ as a result of that. But we took a break of Hebrews in November in order to celebrate Advent, so now we're returning to Hebrews just in time to remind us of what we should treasure in this new year. You see, at just the right time, God himself will unbury the treasure that we have hidden. And when he does so, God will not use a shovel. He'll use a sword. Translating literally, for alive is the word of God. An active, effective, powerful, and sharper than any double-edged sword. And penetrating as far as dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. When God unburies the treasure that we've hidden, this is the instrument that he will use. Now, as a young man, when I was building fences on the ranch, I dug holes for wooden stabilizers consisting of two wooden peeler cores and two by fours that held them apart and some wire that held them together in tension. We would use these as anchors and then put metal fence posts in between them and then put another stabilizer. Now, you can imagine how difficult it would be to pound metal fence posts into ground that's full of rock. Or how hard it would be to dig these holes for peeler cores in ground that's full of rock. On hot days, the work seemed to take forever, and the post would turn and twist as I would try to pound them in. I'd take the, the fence uh, post um, digger, and, uh, and I would look down and it would be only like two inches since the last time I looked. It was hard. Some people had tractors with attachments on the back, augers. And I looked longingly at one of those augers. My dad and always did everything uh, manually. I was hoping that I could have one of those. But even uh, people with augers had difficulty digging in that soil. But no matter how many rocks are in the way or how hard the soil, the Word of God is alive, effective, and powerful. It is sharp, sharper than any double-edged sword, sharper and more powerful than any tractor's auger. The Word of God will penetrate through resistance, and nothing 
will keep the word of God from finding the treasure that we have buried deep inside. As the word of God penetrates, it will divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow, neither the life within us, our spirit, our physical bodies will stop the word of God from achieving its goal. So now that we're completely freaked out, let's, uh, let's ask the question, what is the word of God digging for? And what is the treasure that the word of God is seeking? Well, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what it's going after, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Did I mention that it's important for us to examine the type of treasure we're collecting and where we place that treasure? What is the treasure? Where have we placed it? What are the conditions? Well, Hebrews has given us a treasure map. Whatever we treasure is not located in our liver or our spleen. Our treasure is not in our left ankle or our right ankle earlobe. That much makes sense. The treasure is located in the heart. But you might think, well, why is the treasure not located in our head? After all, the head is where thoughts occur and they're translated down our spine into action. Why not the head? Well, I believe the Word of God is focused upon our heart because the heart is the residence of our will. We're not simply talking about physiology here, not just our bodies, but psychology, pneumatology, and us as creatures dependent upon God. The Word of God is not just concerned about what we think, but our affections, our attitudes, our purposes. What we think is important, but there is a volitional activating component to the heart. Our attitudes towards God and people are tied to the heart. The heart is the center of affections. Thoughts and mind are weighed and activated by the hearts. The hearts are meant to be the dwelling place for the Spirit of God. We are complex creatures, right? We're not just the five pounds of dust and whatever amount of water that comprise our bodies. There is more to us than that. And God wants every part of us, our thoughts, our attitudes, our soul, our spirit, our joints, our marrow, he knows where to dig for the treasure that affects them all. So when God digs for the treasure in our hearts, it will not be like me digging for through rocky soil. God will use his word, and nothing will keep God's word from reaching the treasure in our hearts. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Perhaps you felt awkward standing naked in the doctor's office sometime. Anybody there? And there is certainly no privacy in giving birth. There are certain times when we feel naked and exposed, and, and we don't typically like that. But what if we were naked and exposed more than just our physical body, but our thoughts, our attitudes, our affections, our intentions, everything were laid bare? How much more uncomfortable would that be? But that's exactly what is going to take place when the Word of God uncovers everything. Everything is open to God's eyes, the God before whom we must give account. What if the rocky soil around our hearts were no match for the Word of God as it reached its final goal and opened our treasure? And what if upon opening the treasure of our hearts, we were judged for the treasure that was found? The digging's done, the chest is open. Are there termite droppings? Did moth and rust destroy? That's why the book of Hebrews, quoting Psalm 95, repeats this three times. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hebrews 3, 7 through 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hebrews 3, 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hebrews 4, 7. Think we're, try we're supposed to learn something here? When Bill buried his treasure in the ground, it was in the wrong place to hide the treasure. But the reason Bill buried his treasure in the ground in a glass jar was because he didn't trust institutions. When we bury our treasure in an unwise place and unwise conditions, it's because we do not trust the nature or power of God. Will God keep our treasure safe? Can I trust him with it? 
And if we hear the voice of God speaking to us, will we trust him or will we harden our hearts? In Hebrews, there is an example of a generation not to follow that hardened their hearts. That generation did not hold up the name of God as holy, but worshiped idols. They did not look forward to the kingdom where God would rule, but wanted to uh, be a, a kingdom like all the other nations. They did not trust God for their physical and spiritual needs, thanking him for provision, but grumbled at what seemed to be lacking. And neither that generation nor the generation that followed throughout the book of Judges could be characterized by forgiveness or fleeing temptation. Instead, Scripture holds them up as the example par excellence of hardened hearts. Well, how about us? What are the conditions that we're placing our treasure in? What is the condition of our heart? Do we fail to trust God with our treasure because what we treasure is not God? Many have longed for the year of 2020 to be over, have we not? I mentioned that earlier. Uh, many have looked for hope to 2021. And as I mentioned before, I too look longingly hoping that 2021 will be a more pleasant year than 2020. Now, some people have done just fine in this past year, but many have struggled, and there have been many legitimate difficulties. I am hoping for a year of healing, hoping for a year when we can gather without restriction, a year of joy. But 2021 is not our hope. If we're looking for comfort, security, and freedom from restriction as our hope, we're misguided. It may be that God has used the year of 2020 to till up the soil that needed to be tilled. As hard as that soil was that I had been digging as a young man, the soil around many of our hearts is, more, is harder and more difficult. And it may be that God used this past year to dig up the soil around our hearts, the hearts of the people in our nation, hearts of people throughout the world for what he's about to do next. I don't presume to know the will of God, but I do know in farming you have to dig up the soil before you plant the seed and something grows. And it may be that we should look back on 2020 not thinking that it's a terrible year, but maybe it was a necessary year, and praying that God will use a tilling of that soil for his glory, both in us personally, in our nation, and our surrounding community throughout the world, that God would do that. That 2020 was the year of the tilled soil, and 2021 should be the year of planting, watering, and growing. Last year, I made a plan for 2020. Anybody do that? You get your planner out, and you write down all the things you're going to do. And, and it was probably my best year yet when it came to planning. It was awesome. I, I, I looked at that plan and I thought, wow, this is a good plan for the year. I finally got it together. I'm ready to go. And then all these things happened that I didn't expect and everything that I did expect didn't happen. It was a different year than I expected. And maybe for all of us, as, and, and planning is necessary. If you don't plan for dinner, it doesn't happen, right? You have to plan but you also have to remain flexible. And maybe what we need to do, rather than worrying about the specifics of planning, is worry about our key priorities. What are our priorities that will remain solid as we remain flexible about how they get implemented? What's the treasure in our heart that will affect our actions and help bring clarity to our changing plans? Let's talk about the nature of our treasure as we think about the future. So the key priority, the treasure that dictates our thoughts and attitudes, our volition and affection, the way we think about God and the way we treat others is Christ. Or as Augustine of Hippo once said, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. Jesus is our hope, our mercy, our strength, and as the song goes, thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart, and the boast of my tongue. And so we come to Jesus, our greatest hope, worshiping with joy and trusting him in the future. And the location where we keep our treasure is our hearts. And the condition of that treasure, or that treasure chest, should be soft towards God, responsive towards God. That's the condition that will be best for keeping the treasure 
that we should have there. Proverbs 2.4 says that the wisdom of God should be our treasure. We should look for God's wisdom as if it was silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. Isaiah 33.6 explains that the Lord himself should be our treasure, and the fear of the Lord is the key to that treasure. Isaiah 44.9, we're told that idols are worthless treasure. Bury the idol in the treasure chest of your heart, and you will come up with termite droppings. Well, he doesn't really say that, but... um, (laughs) Treasure Christ, and you will not be disappointed. Treasure Christ, and you'll have the priority, the key priority for everything else in your life. 1 Corinthians 3.15, we learn that our work will be tested in the end with fire, and only that which is unburned will matter. And then Jesus, in his most famous message, anybody know what Jesus' most famous message was? Matthew 5 through 7. Hey, if you know, shout it out. Sermon on the Mount. Mount. That is is awesome. Thank you. All right. He said this, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth, termite droppings, where moth and vermin destroy and termites, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven, where moth and vermin and termites do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure and your heart go together. So if today, when uh, were the day that our hearts were uncovered, what would the Word of God find? If you were fully exposed right now, and I don't mean just physically naked, that too, but everything else was laid bare. If everything that you are and think and thought, your emotions, everything were laid bare, what would the Word of God find? What treasure would be at the center of it all? Do you know? Two things seem abundantly clear in Scripture about storing up lasting treasure in our hearts. First, if our hearts are full of other things, There is no room for the things of God, and idolatrous treasure in our hearts will bring about ruin on the day of our heart's examination by the Word of God. If it's full of other stuff, there's no room for God. Number two, what the Word of God will find valuable on the day of our heart's examination is the presence of Christ in our hearts. When Christ is present in our hearts, we need not fear when Christ examines our hearts. That makes sense. So how can Christ be present in our hearts, we ask? If Christ is the treasure in our hearts, he'll be the priority over all other earthly treasure. And so to the rich man who would follow him in Mark 10, 21, Jesus said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And let me be clear, Jesus wasn't against people who had a lot of wealth. What he wanted them to understand, though, was the priority for their wealth and what earthly things are good for. Earthly things are good for the earth. Earthly things are good for earthly people. But in the end, they won't come with us. And so this body, these possessions, these talents, everything that we have, everything we can do, everything we are, ought to be used for God's glory here on earth. That's the purpose, and that's the focus when what we treasure in our hearts is Christ. In describing the kingdom of God, Jesus told his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then to his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Everything. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and bought it, Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Everything. Now, day after day, throughout this next year and the years that follow, what would happen if we said, oh, God is the priority of my life. God loved the world so much he sent his son Jesus to die for the world. And when we put our faith in Christ, when we trust that God loved the world so much that we can entrust him with ourselves, with our treasure, 
when we come to treasure Christ, everything else will be put right. Doesn't mean 2021 is going to be a great year. May or may not. Doesn't say anything about 2022. But it gives us new perspective on every day that we have. And trusting God with time, the time of our lives, our nation, leadership of our nation, our community, our world, our children, our possessions, our health, everything. Luke 6.45 gives us a quick diagnostic of the heart. How can we know what's in a person's heart? Can we know that at all? Is there any way to know that? Now remember I, I said earlier that Bev spoke the truth with integrity of heart. How do you know? Well, you can't know like God knows. We're not the word of God that can go in like a scalpel and lay everything bare. But we do have some diagnostics. One of the diagnostics is in Luke 6, 45. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of, said Jesus. I believe Beverly found the pearl of great price, the treasure in the field, the bread of life, the living water, and submitted the thoughts and attitudes of her heart. How do you know? Because of what's said. Now, it's not true. You know, if you, if you take anyone, you, you measure all their words. There are some things that are foolish and some things that are wise, but you can get a trajectory of what people care about, what their passions are, what they believe by what they say. That's one of the, the ways that we can know. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm always encouraged when Christians give generously because generosity and the ability to let go of what God has already given us is a measure of the softness of the heart and what we actually treasure. It's a diagnostic tool. Doesn't matter about that stuff. It's all going to burn anyway. What matters is what's in the heart. That's what's going to last. Well, I want to... Um, I want to help us land the plane when we, when we, as we think about this next year on what are we actually going to do? So if, if the heart's important, if treasuring Christ is important, what will be our priorities this year? What things will we do to, to help us treasure Christ more? I have, uh, I have some series goals here that were written long ago. They weren't written for today in particular, but I think they're helpful for today in particular. First of all, am I growing in my knowledge and passion for Jesus? It's just a question. Are you growing towards God or are you growing further away from him? Nobody's staying stationary. We're all moving all the time. Are we moving closer or further apart? Now, number two was written for the Hebrew series in particular because um, we tend to find the New Testament easier than the Old Testament to understand. There's more cultural distance between our time and the Old Testament. Sometimes it's hard to read some of the things written in the Old Testament, make sense out of them. But it's important because it's the foundation for the New Testament. So you can't really divide these two. So I encourage you, if you want to learn more about the Old Testament, go read the book of Hebrews. It's more accessible to each one of us. And then you can look up the things that the book of Hebrews refers to. I want, to, uh, I want to go back to number one, too, and I was, hoping, um, I was hoping in this knowledge and passion of Jesus um, that uh, we as a congregation would be memorizing the Word of God. And so um, for the past few months, uh, we have been, I've been uh, including something called Eat This Book. There's a little piece of scripture on the bottom, memorization. We'll be going back to that uh, in, in a few weeks, but I encourage you to eat this book. There are untruths that we all say about ourselves and about the world, and the Word of God refutes them. If there are untruths, things that you say about yourself that are unhelpful, that tear you down, that are untrue in the eyes of God, find some scripture that refutes that, memorize it, eat this book. It's important that we understand the, the, the scope of scripture. It's good to read through the Bible. I encourage you to do that. But sometimes we need a little piece of scripture that actually speaks to our hearts when there's something untrue that needs to be refuted. 
want to encourage you to eat this book and pray about those things. Number three, are we becoming better equipped and motivated to share our faith? Well, we can't share what we don't have, right? If we're not treasuring Christ, it's hard to share that treasure with anyone else. If Christ isn't the most important thing to us, it's hard for everyone else to say, hey, look at that, that's awesome. Rather than just, hey, look at that, what, what, what are you talking about there? It's important for us, first of all, to, to treasure Christ, to understand who he is in order to be able to share it with other people, to have integrity of heart. And then when we have integrity of heart, as we grow in Christ, to speak boldly and clearly and not be afraid to share with others. And then uh, my series goal was for us to be strengthened. As I mentioned, one of the ways for us to be strengthened is when we speak uh, things that are untrue to ourselves, to memorize the Word of God. But another way to be strengthened is for us to Um, be in fellowship with other believers, other people who will lift us up and encourage us. Go prayer walk with somebody else. Go tell someone, you know, let a little bit of your secrets out and say, and trust somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. I want to be transparent with you. I need someone to talk to. Go ahead and do it. Find someone who has that treasure to share it with. Already talked about eating this book. Here's what I'd like you to do right now as we, as we close um, the message portion of this service. I want you to close your eyes and imagine whatever brings you the most comfort, the greatest security, the most passionate joy. Take a minute. What are you living for? What are your struggles? Where have you placed your hope? Whatever we loved and longed for here on earth points to something better. Comfort, security, earthly joy are short-lived. We enjoy them for a time and then they're gone, but God has given us something greater, greater comfort and security and joy through Jesus. Christ is a better messenger than anyone you have ever known, a better message than you've ever received, a message that comforts when all other comfort is gone. He is better than any angel or heavenly power. The security he provides is greater than any protection we could have on earth or in heaven. Jesus is better than the saints of the past, offering a better promise, a better land for those who seek him, where they will find rest for their souls and incomparable joy. Christ intercedes for us. He's made the ultimate sacrifice for us and given the most amazing promise to us for the brightest future. So why wouldn't we follow the faithful examples of saints of the past? Why wouldn't we place our hope in Jesus and endure the struggles of this world with hope? Faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. So whatever we've been living for, whatever our struggles, wherever we placed our hope, whatever we loved and longed for here on earth points to something better, better. And I encourage you that something better is Christ, and he is the one in whom we should treasure. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the word of God, alive, active, effective, powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It can divide not only our joints and marrow, but the attitudes and thoughts and affections of our heart. Everything is laid bare before your sight. Sometimes we act like we want to hide, as if we could hide from you. Help us to live each day examining our treasure and knowing that it's you. Amen. I want to encourage you. Now is a time of the Lord's Supper. And uh, since we have some guests here, and, and, uh, and I don't know who's online, uh, I, I would like you to hit the connect button and let us know. Um, we just see um, that people are... Uh, part of it, and every now and then somebody responds to us. 
But as we come to the time of the Lord's Supper, uh, you might ask, is this for me? Is this time for me? The Lord's Supper is when Jesus, um, with his disciples, said the bread represents his body, the, the cup, his blood, and, and basically he's saying, all of me for you. New promise, new hope. Well, I want to encourage you, this meal is for all who put their faith in Christ. And it may be that you're a longtime Christian. And you may be from a different denomination. It doesn't really matter. I don't think when we get to heaven, there's going to be the Southern Baptist section and the Lutheran section and the Evangelical Free section and the Catholic section. If you're there, you're there. And um, every tribe and nation. So if you've been wondering about this, you know, should I take this meal or not, I encourage you, if, if you put your faith in Christ, uh, go ahead and participate with us. There may be something in between you and the Lord that needs to be confessed. There may be some sin that you're aware of, or perhaps you have felt, maybe I, maybe I haven't really treasured Christ as I should. Well, there's a time of silence to do that. To go ahead and confess what you need to confess, to go ahead and, um, and get right with God. It's also a time when we can praise God and thank him for all he's done. And then it might be that you've never put your faith in Christ. You've never prayed uh, for Jesus to be Lord of your life. And if that's you, this is also a time when you can do that. You could actually be holding the very elements that Jesus said is the, the kernel of this whole thing. It's the gospel. It's the good news. It's, it's what I've done for you. And as you're holding them, give your life to Christ and then partake with us. Whatever your situation, I want to pray that uh, God will meet with you through his Holy Spirit right now. So I will begin our prayer. I'll give some time of silence for you to pray, and then we'll partake together. Father God, thank you for the hope we have in Christ. There is no greater hope. There is no other treasure that will last. And all of the things that we do, all of our affections, our attitudes, our good deeds, God, let them be infected and affected by Christ. Let the volitional component of our lives be affected by treasuring Christ. For all who do not believe that they're loved by God, let them know that that's not true because of Christ. Whatever we've longed for, whatever we have loved here on earth, Lord, let it be replaced by Christ. As we come here to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would come among us as we pray our individual prayers. Speak to us. Your servants are listening. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, our greatest hope, our treasure, took the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He said, this is my body. Take this in remembrance of me. Let's take any...
The same way Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Why don't you all so do this in remembrance of me? Father, we thank you for the bread of life. We thank you for the gift of hope. We thank you for the treasure of Jesus, who is worth all that we are, all that we can do, and all that we have. Amen. Thank you, Cabot. As we conclude our service, let's stand and sing our closing song. with a benediction from 1 Peter 22. 
Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this was the word that was preached to you. God bless you. Go in peace.